I'll do uh, an introduction here for Anand, and then we'll start our fireside chat where we're going to do several polls throughout that chat, and we will leave time for Q&A. Um, but our theme today is going to be around organizational structure, and um, Anand has a, you know, a really a great perspective to, to, to bring to bear here. Uh, we've known each other for over 15 years now, actually, when we were, were starting TSIA. Uh, he was involved when he was at, I think it was Vignette, and then uh, they actually got gobbled up by by HP and has had many roles, but now in his role at Ring Central, he has really all the moving parts, right? So the services and the engineering and, and sales and all this stuff. So so it has a very broad perspective on organizational structure and and, and how, you know, what, what trends are, 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 are changing in the industry that makes us think differently about organizational structure. So, so welcome, Anand, we're ready to get into this. Absolutely, man. Firstly, it's so great. I just, you just, I just feel like I'm back into the family when I uh, come into a conversation with TSI. It's a bummer that you know it's virtual. It's not live. Would have loved to meet so many familiar faces uh, if I was there. But uh, but excited to be here. Excited to have the conversation, Thomas. Thank you for inviting me. Yep. Oh, our our pleasure, man. So so let me just set up org structure sort of trends in, in general in tech. And so for those of you not familiar. Uh, for the past seven, maybe eight years now, we do an annual org structure survey that is designed to, to really understand three things. Number one, uh, what what functions are in play in a tech company? And number two, where do those functions you know typically report? And, and number three, what reporting structure drives the best financial performance? And so, so every year we refresh that. And there are some some Uber trends that have been going on for the past seven years. Number one, uh, the globalization of service functions. So we know that when service functions, whether it's support or, or professional services or even customer success, when they're globalized, they perform better financially. Uh, we have seen the rise of customer success. Seven years ago, that was a minority practice to have customer success in play. Now, over 70% of the companies you know, who participate in this survey say, yes, I have a distinct customer success organization. We also see managed services, much more common to be in play. But we also see this, this wall that continues to exist between service and, and product. So, so folks that work on service offers, service portfolio teams, they're one function. The folks that work on product offers, it's a distinct function. And so, um, but, but you know, the, the world continues to change. And so that's what we um, are going to continue to talk about. You know, where do we think the, the puck is going, if you will, or, or where is the ball going? And I just want to warm the group up here and, again, get used to, the, uh, to, to, to using the polling capability. The, the first question here, just curious, does your company have distinct P&Ls for each service line? You know, education services, support services, professional services. Is that the way you're structured right now? A simple yes or no. Let's see. Let's see what, how the data comes in here. And uh, let's get this morning. We had fantastic responses, uh, quick responses. So let's just uh, see if we can get the N up here. And as soon as I see the, the trend settling, I'll uh, I'll report the data here. And Anand, you, you, you're you're an old services guy. I know you're used to having distinct service P&Ls in play. <laughs> I I am very eager to see what uh, the polling yeah. feedback uh, comes back as. Yeah. So so yeah, the trends are already very very clear right now. Really good response. And we're at about an 80-20 rule. About 80% of the of the companies are saying, you know, yes, we have distinct service PLs in place. So so my first question to you as 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 we move forward, you know, what do you think is the future of these distinct service line PLs? Do, do they stay intact? Do we see more blurring? What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, now I'll say two things before I answer the question, Thomas. Uh, number one, if I look at my company, Ring Central, today we have very discrete services PLs, uh, mm -hmm. the conventional way, as you would expect. Uh, and I'm going to try to answer this question without, in some ways, pre announcing an off change or an accountability change because we are on a journey as a company. You know, the first thing is I think we've got to take a step back. I think one of the things I have been frustrated about in my services roles for the majority of my career is I felt I had a services PL accountability, which was often, if not always, disconnected with the larger company context. 
mm -hmm. uh, which leads us all to do things. How many times have we tried to drive a services dollar for the sake of a services dollar, which doesn't accrue to what the company is eventually measured on? Probably all the time. And so we have to take a step back, and that's what we are doing, which is our, I have two questions, which is not just how does services accountability fit in context of the company, where's the company PL going? And where mm -hmm. are the company accountabilities going? And my perspective is today, it is largely function driven accountabilities. They're discrete, and for the most part, they are non overlapping. Like sales is responsible for bringing in the bookings or you know the, the top line. The, the services folks are measured on uh, services revenue and and uh, you know and margin. And the support organization wants to be restricted to uh, you know a certain percentage of the revenue and so on and so forth. But tomorrow, I think we have to we will evolve and morph to a customer or a user journey driven accountability. And I'll repeat that it's a customer or user journey driven. And everything which happens after PL accountabilities will actually be an outcome of that customer or user journey. Uh, and I, I look at two concepts. Everybody will have a discrete accountability, but everybody will also have a shared responsibility across you know, different functions. That's the first step on our way to the ops structure for a SaaS business, probably looking completely different from how it looks today. And so that's the virtual uh, circle of awareness. You know, Thomas, you, you, you've talked about layer, uh, you know, it's acquisition or land, it's value creation, you know, and usage or adoption. Uh, it is nurture or upsell. And then, you know, you, you do get onto that virtuous cycle. But the key is then how does all of this come together in quantified goals? And as I look at it, you know, how am I measured on right now? Uh, the street looks as a, looks at our companies and says they are most interested in looking at subscription revenue growth. They're looking at XMRR, which is the true, you know, uh, fundamental health of a SaaS business, and then net retention, renewal usage and churn. That's the first order metrics. And then there are many key indicators which go below that, like NPS, you know, uh, lifetime value, customer acquisition cost. Uh, ARPU or you know ARPA, what is the average revenue per account? And then all the functional metrics have to accrue to be above. Today, it is too siloed. So now let me answer the question, how do I see services things change? I honestly see the service p &Ls as we know it, just focused on revenue or margin for the sake of it completely disappearing. I see the conventional org boundaries we have today between customer success support and professional services completely disappearing. I see the key accountability of a post sale motion linked to NPS and net retention. So what does it mean? Value realization, and you've got to quantify that. Nurture, you've got to quantify that. Usage, adoption, renewals, upsell, across support, customer success, and pro serve. And so in some ways, the shape of the PNL, the shape of the services PNL, is as important, if not more important, than the accountability of the services PNL. That's where I see the journey going for the services business and the accountabilities of the services business. Key concept: discrete account, discrete accountability, and shared responsibility. Okay, so so you came out with guns blazing there. There's you put a lot a lot on the table, and so that's great. So let me let, let me um, put a couple things on on the table around this, right? So. So the rock and the hard spot that we see when it comes to service PL, right, is on one end, we, we know historically, and you know this personally, you have battle scars around this, that, that if services did not have a PL that they could manage to, then they, they really they didn't get the funding they needed. You know, you become a cost center, you know, you, it, it's tough to get investment. It, it just so that's why we created these stovepipe PLs, right? That was the way to basically get, you know, funding into service motions, whether it was support or professional services. So that's one end. On the other end, though, we know that those stovepipe P&Ls are not serving us well anymore, which is what you just asserted. We know that, for example, if you have a complex managed offer with a customer that needs a pinch of PS and a pinch of support and a pinch of education, and everyone's trying to protect their own personal P&L, that that doesn't work anymore, right? It, it, it's overhead. It's it's creating friction that you don't that you don't want. And and so the third thing I'll put on the table, you gravitated to this concept of account profitability, account margin, right? So you had those you know recurring revenues and renewal rates, et cetera. And then right beneath that 
what's the profitability of accounts? And, and I can, uh, assure you, vast majority of tech, tech companies could not tell you definitively the profitability of a given account, <laughs> right? Because they, they don't operate the P&Ls that way. And I'm with you. I think that that becomes a much more important North Star. So everybody says, look, once we add up all the costs from all the different functions that were in, in, you know, that we're putting into this account, is this a profitable account? Yes or no? And if not, why not? Right? What are we going to have to do to do it differently? So, so I agree with you. I mean, I think there's a lot of pressure forcing us to re rethink this. We have to tread carefully, as you know, because we don't want to eviscerate funding into you know critical fun, you know service functions, et cetera, or any function of the company. But the current you know structure, I don't think will just cannot stand. And so that's why we, we are a proponent of things like service convergence and and thinking about different you know profitability metrics for sure or success metrics. But it, yeah, this is going to be an interesting one for sure. It, it's going to be an interesting one. And the only thing I'd add to you know what how you summarize it was really good, Thomas. It has implications on everything we do in services or support or customer success. For example, our, the method in which we create offerings will have to evolve. I mean, today, an offering in a ProServe organization is based on deploying the customer. It may not have enough teeth uh, follow-up or accountability for usage, for adoption, for the other things which matter, number one. Number two, more and more you see the offering strategy sort of started to diverge from a product organization and from a services organization. And at some point, if this has got to work, you got to think about your offerings to the customers at a higher level and then think through who does what versus services offerings is separate from your sales pricing and packaging is separate from what product does. And so the offering strategy has got to be singular for the company, yep. not by much. Yep. Yeah, I, tol I totally agree. And, and we're going to gnaw on that thought as well in terms of that, the, the complete offer thought. But I want to talk, because you, you already put this on the table as well, in terms of the role of sales and services working together to grow an account, right? And so, so you know, we think in this term of what we call layer economics. So what's the best way to cost, you know, effectively grow a customer? Because historically in tech, you know, that was the role of sales. The salesperson lands, the salesperson does a renewal. If the, customer, if the customer wants to talk about any commercials, a salesperson is involved. Yet we know, in fact, I think there's, we have a session here as part of the conference, you know, why should customer success own renewals? We have a lot of data now showing that that, that is much more nuanced, right? The relationship between who should be doing what, you know, to 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 to, to grow an account is changing. So so let, let's do another quick poll and see where the audience is on this and this is around you know the relationship um you, you know with services in the account of commercial so yes or no question does services within your company have any commercial responsibilities yes or no let, let, let's see where, where folks are coming in on on this one and the data is but people are quit this is i feel like i'm playing a, a round of jeopardy here like uh, i'm hosting jeopardy <laughs> people are so click fast with these clickers that i love it people are well, this, is, this is awesome man this is yeah I, I love the way you're you know the engagement with uh with the audience is fabulous yeah it's good and so um so wow strong trend here just like we saw in the, in the last one so this is uh, vacillating between an 80, wow, it was 70, 30. It's, that, it's about an 80, 20 rule right now. 80% of folks coming back and saying, yes, you know, services has uh, some responsibility for, for commercial. So, so the question I have for you is, is how do you, do you see these, these roles and responsibilities being, you know, changing between sales and services over time so you can cost effectively grow, you know, your customers? No, it's, it's a great question. And, you know, obviously, I think, Thomas, this, there's no one right answer, right? There's there's many different flavors of them. I have a point of view, and I'll share my point of view. My point of view is, in its simplest and purest form, probably the, the way to look at it is acquisition versus expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you go and survey the industry, you'll probably see a majority of customers, uh, companies have uh, a CRO and the CRO likely owns both sales and services. Uh, I'm of a different school of thought. Maybe the fact that I grew up in services has something to do with that. But I feel that we've got to distill it down into its essence of focus. And, you know, 
in Ring Central, the CRO is accountable for predominantly acquisition. And obviously, there's many, and that's the discrete accountability. The discrete accountability is acquisition of customers with the right LTV by CAC and everything you need to go, you know, do to make that happen. There are shared responsibilities. There are shared responsibilities like NPS and upsell. And, and you know, I say upsell as a shared responsibility because, you know, obviously the sales team has a significant role to play there, but this is where the post-sale team start to come in in a much more significant way. And then I come to the post-sale side of the house. There are discrete accountabilities there, which is nurture, which leads to expansion, usage, uh, value realization, renewals. I put all of that on the post-sale side of the mm-hmm. house. And so that's how I see, uh, and, and the difference we have seen in the growth, I mean, and this is public information as we uh, shared last year's numbers. Interestingly, uh, as soon as I finish this this conversation with you, I go into Ring Central's earnings call. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, but reflecting on last year's earnings call, 2020, by making this change of focus, acquisition for the sales teams and joint accountability for upsell, and renewals and usage growth, net retention on the post-sales teams, we almost doubled the rate of growth uh, company compared to prior years. This is my point of view. Well, and and your point of view is backed up by data. So there's a survey we do in in the revenue generation area, and, and the data shows definitively that if you take renewal responsibility and and you basically put it somewhere else, customer success, renewal specialist, and have sales not worry about that, subscription revenues grow faster, right? Mm -hmm. To your point, this focus point, in in my experience is, you know, I still think that there are really two types of tech companies right now when, when it comes to this relationship between sales and services and layer economics. One, there's one profile that is is what you're articulating, saying, look, I'm realizing that this is a, a more of a team sport and I want sales to be more on land or large expansion. I, I want services to be more on the adoption and the and and help on upsell and own the renewal. And they're they're you know, they're really leaning into that model and we're seeing better economics. There's still, I think, a good chunk of tech companies who say, look, there is this very you know church and state conversation between a sales commercial conversation and services. And services should not be involved in commercials because they're the trusted advisor. They they can't handle it. That's not their DNA. So they're not. We're not going to let them cross that line. And I I think that that's still many companies, you know, have that philosophy. But I just don't think the data supports that as the winning model anymore. I, th- I think you know we've got to move past Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in, in a SaaS world, in a true SaaS world, it it you know those boundaries don't exist. In fact. Yes, there is a point in time where you trigger a renewal, but you know what? If you do what you need to do as a company well, which is nurture, then renewal almost becomes a fate accompli, right? It's yeah, not that's right. this massive yeah. motion where you have to re, uh, you know, sell the customer on your value. If they are using it, you know, across the board, and if they are adopting it as well as they should, uh, and if they see the value for the business, which needs to be quantified in a straight line. Uh, and a function of the uh, offerings which the company creates, then renewal becomes a fade accompli. Then the conversation is not renewal. I'm not worried as much about renewals. The right. conversation is asking the team is net retention, which is upsell plus renewals, which is yep. if you're just at 100%, man, we're not doing a great job. How do you get to uh, significantly higher than 100% without, right. you know, good? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll give you another data point from, from uh, and this is why we restructure our, our practices here around customer re- renewal and, and growth, which we announced today, uh, because this relationship between expansion and renewal is so critical. And what you see in the data is if a cust- you get a customer on your platform, and if they do any type of expansion with you before the renewal is due, right, it's tiny, whatever, the renewal rates go up, right? Because they're getting value and they're like, oh yeah. And so to your point, when the renewal comes up, it's like, of course I'm using this, right? And I'm, I've actually expanded my relationship with you. And so those two motions, you know, just really, you know, it's a virtual cycle when it's occurring. So um, it's it's so important. But yeah, I think I think that in terms of, again, our general theme here on org structure, the, the these hard lines of demarcation between sales responsibilities and services ha- have got to blur. I don't think there's, I think the data is already very clear in that. People need to, you know, get their arms around that. But here's one that that's harder. 
I think. And and this is around, you know, like you're talking about the, the responsibility for the complete uh, offer. And and so, you know, we still see this really distinct separation between organizations within a tech company that are focused on the service definitions. And we are seeing more convergence there, right? You'll have a service offer portfolio team that owns, hey, I, I define all the service offers, the support, the PS, education, et cetera. But then there's a very distinct team that focuses on the product. And often those two aren't converging until very late in the development you know, or the offer cycle, right? It's like product has this offer and it's throwing it over the wall still to, to services. And you know that is not you know, optimal. So another polling question here, we'll, we'll see where, where people are on this one, is around you know, those responsibilities. So are, are you modifying the roles and responsibilities related to developing offers? Yes or no? Are you rethinking this so that you get more of a complete thought between the product and the services so that you have offers that really are optimized, you know, to drive, you know, growth with customers? So let's see where the data, and, and again, all these, we are getting some really strong market signals on all these questions. So that tells you there's tension in the system. On <laughs> There's a lot of tension in the system. They're forcing people to, to rethink. So this one, well, I gotta let this one play out. This one's fluctuating a little bit more, mm. a little bit more. It was started around 60, 40. Now it's drifting. Oh, we gotta get, I gotta get over the, get a little closer to our, our numbers before. People are maybe hesitating on this one, not hitting the, the clickers as fast on this one. About 67.33, kids going right back and forth there. So so not quite 70.30, so a little bit softer than the others, but about 66% about of the folks right now saying, yes, they are they are rethinking you know, the, the, these relationships. So, so what are your thoughts on that in terms of how do you get these you know, these stovepiped product and service teams to, to, to work together more effectively. What, what are the, the levers that you think we can pull there? You know, it, it's, it's a, this, and this is a hard one, right? You know, when we talk about sales and services, I think the journey is pretty straightforward. Uh, everybody gets it. But there are bigger silos between product and services. And I say services broadly, support, mm -hmm. uh, customer is. success and services. But I'd also, I'd say two things there before I, dive into the meat of your question. Number one, we've got to think about the customer versus the user. Mm -hmm. And there are two, two nuances there, and we've got to think about both. Uh, because when it comes to a customer conversation, you know, driving growth, driving usage, usually the services, you know, the post sales teams take lead on it. But it, when it comes to a user, growth when it comes to user acquisition if the pandemic has proved anything it's shown us that the boundaries between the enterprise and the consumer you you know uh, is is blurring mm -hmm. and so the product teams start to usually now take uh prime accountability and first steps on user growth so that's one key mm -hmm. one the yeah. other thing i would also say is you've got to add marketing to the mix marketing historically has been hey demand brand you know corporate marketing and all of that but Growth, user growth marketing is also something which starts to become more and more important. So those are the two nuances, you know, I would add. Uh, I come back to the same thing, which is shared accountability on how do you instrument the telemetry of how your customers are using your product and how do you create AI-based next best actions for it? That's something which has got to be done between the two of them as shared accountabilities. Yeah. But then well, accountability yeah. for products and marketing, which is what are the innovation trends? What are the, where are the products? You know, what is the usage yep. adoption user growth? And similarly, there are discrete accountabilities for services, first call resolution, CPI, usage adoption, customer growth. Those are discrete responsibilities on the post sales uh, side of the house. And then all of these signals on both sides makes the other side better. Support call drivers need to be a factor in how we evolve our products. It makes that better. And so that's how I see it. This is one where the boundaries are blurring, but then come back, you know, to the meat of your, the, the headline of your question, who creates the offers? The offers, you know, we have to take a step back and break offer creation at every function, whether it's product or sales or services, offer creation has to happen at a company level. And we are working through right now, where does it happen? Uh, what are the outcomes you expect of these offers? How do you measure them and instrument them? And then based on that, 
what does each function do between product, which will have a primacy of user, and services which will have a primacy of customer, what does each of them do and how do you take that to market? So that's the journey we are on right now. Offer creation has to be singular at a company level. Yeah, we we, we agree with that. And, and, and you know, we see two moves on the, on the chessboard for most tech companies. One, in terms of organizational structure, is, is really rationalization on just the service portfolio. So service conversions have one team really think about the service offers instead of stovepipe there. The second move on the chessboard is what you're talking about here is really an offer team that thinks about the complete offer. And that's, they don't think about it. You know, I only focus on the product. I only focus on the service piece of it. They have to have the complete thought. Otherwise you don't sign offers that have all the telemetry, et cetera, you know, that, that you need to, to feed both sides of that equation as you just articulated. So, um, but that second move on the chessboard, I think people have been much more hesitant to, to do the um, and but I think you know it, it's coming um, and, and you know and one of the reasons it's coming is, is again just how we drive growth is is changing so another poll I, I want to do here we talked about this in the opening keynote around the importance of product led growth and, and you also just put that on the table the fact that you know you should be using the product and the platform and the AI to to take the customer on a journey just through the product itself right no sales or you know, human touch you know, required here. And so let's see where people are. And, and the question is, is your company currently investing in product-led uh, growth capabilities? You know, yes or no? And let's see where people come in on this one. And, and by the way, we had this discussion this morning on it. You know, there's some confusion out in the marketplace that people think about product-led growth. They say, well, yeah, I just create really compelling products and that's what drives the growth of my company. This, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about product platforms that are, you know, leading the customer on the journey through the product, you know, from, from you know, freemium to actually paying, to being able to click to buy more, to automatically renewing, et cetera, et cetera. And, okay. and other things there like, you know, in product notifications, which lead the customer to a better experience and so on. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. So this one, um, you know, this ratio is becoming very popular here. So about 70, 30, right on the nose, 70% of the companies saying, you know, yes, that we are investing in, in product, you know, led growth. And so, um, and again, I, you also put on the table this blurring between consumer and enterprise experiences. So, so do, you, do you think that the enterprise community has a lot to learn from the, the, the consumer technology community on this topic in terms of product led growth? Absolutely. I think uh, as an enterprise professional, our choices are significantly influenced by the consumer choices, the choices we make as a as a personal user or as a consumer. So I think I think those boundaries are you know significantly breaking, and I think that's the way to go. I mean, if you look at simple use cases, like look at the companies which broke out in the pandemic. They didn't break out because all the enterprises wanted to use them. They broke out because there was a huge consumer desire for solutions yeah. as we went into the pandemic and when you're looking at it as a CIO and saying 30% of my you know employees already use this product it's very hard then to use and introduce a new product which is yeah. just different from you know yeah. where your uh, people are so yeah. that's yeah. going to be an interesting journey for us yeah and you know in one of the pushbacks that i always get on this is is if is that you know a lot of enterprise companies say well you know well our products are very, very complex. They don't lend themselves to these tactics that consumer companies have. And you know, and one of the examples I, I like to, to 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 play back then is I say, look, look at a company like Square, right? So Square has gone after you know retailers, smaller mom and pop, but they did it by saying, look, I'm going to make my hardware and software very simple to use. Right to run your transactions, et cetera. Right, I mean, it's simple to set up, simple to click. You don't need a freaking IT department to run it. And I think that that play is coming to to a majority of the enterprise tech marketplaces. Right, that if you don't have yep. that mentality, right, that, that, that you're, you know, and as JP was talking about this morning, this pivot from complexity to simplicity. That you've got to be, you know. So it's good that, that people are investing this much, you know, in, in this topic. And, and it leads to this next polling question. I want to I want to put on the table, which is around the digital customer experience, and this is another area where I think that enterprise has so much to learn from, you know, B two C. So the question is, you know, do you believe that the digital customer experience is becoming more important to your ability to retain customers 
yes or no. And again, digital customer experience is your customer being able to go on the website and do more and, you know, again, be taken through a journey and guided without having to call you, without having to submit a ticket, without whatever, right? Just like I, you and I can get on, you know, Amazon and do all kinds of things, right? Shopping and never have to talk to anybody. That's, you know, a compelling digital uh, uh, customer experience. So let's just see what people think on this one. Oh, well, they, hey, this is the strongest signal yet. Are you ready for this number here? I'll, 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 wait, I'll wait, get a couple more votes. I don't think it's going to change too much. Wow. So so 98% are saying yes, <laughs> that they believe the digital customer experience is, is important. Um, but, you know, we had a poll this morning in terms of, you know, is there investment there, et cetera. And, and I think there's a gap here on in between how important companies think this, this is and yet how much they're really investing, investing. in it. And yeah. I'll give you an example. I was talking to a, a company just remember just last week and they're trying to get growing. And so, so where's their big investment to grow? S sales headcount. That's, they're like, we're gonna hire more, more people to go knock on doors. That's a, that's a lever, is it the only lever? I, I don't know. And something like the digital customer experience becomes a critical lever for growth. And you know, and apparently the audience agrees it's 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 important. So, um, I you know I think that's going to be a game changing you know capability for sure. It, it, absolutely, it is, Thomas. And this is what I tell you: not only is there a disconnect between uh, what people believe is important and where they're investing, but there's a disconnect between what does digital customer experience even mean. If you ask the question to different companies, you get different answers. Yeah. And there's one other nuance which is very important for us to understand. Digital customer experience, even when people are buying into it, they're buying into it in silos. For example, there's an element of digital customer experience which is just in product, you know, the experience you have when you use it, and how do we uh, use to create the right experience for you to onboard uh, you as a user uh, and to make sure that your journey of adoption is seamless. There's a digital way to do it. But there's also digital customer experiences, for example, in support, as we, you know, all of you are very familiar. How do you create a digital platform for uh, automation in, you know, the first call resolution happens digitally and you're able to solve as many problems as you know you are without, uh, you know, deflecting it to a human agent uh, with the right NPS. Now, guess what? Now, what I see is that digital support platforms are disconnected from the digital customer experience platforms in marketing, are disconnected yep. from digital platforms in product. So that's the first thing is, you know, when you think about a digital platform, let's make sure, and that's the journey we're on. You know, in Ring Central, we have four vectors of our transformation journey. One of the vectors is digitized operations. And digitized operations runs across, you know, it is a red thread which runs across the entire company. When we say digital experience platforms, we're trying to create the process which connects the platform across every function in the company, not silo. So that's that's going to be very critical. But that said, yeah. then if we believe that this is where the future is going, how do you then focus on resources? I mean, the way we look at it right now is we are investing in digitizing for the future. But then the other thing we are investing in is is essentially a retention, because yeah. I. I we believe that retention is the new growth. So where the next wave of investment for us is truly retention and retention across again, retention is usage, adoption, churn, upsell, downsell, all of them. You and retention is user retention in a freemium motion. And so we are investing in that particular skill set. Today it falls in three different groups, product, yeah. marketing and services. My my philosophy is eventually there'll be a retention DRI for the company and Likely, that should be the chief customer officer. That's where we are pivoting a lot of our investments on, assuming the digital experience platform starts to plug in in a much bigger way. Yeah. Well, and if you think about that role and that focal point, because I've I've asked this of, of, of tech companies in the, in the past, you, you know, right now we have a lot of different groups that can throw quote offers out and say, hey, we've got this for the customer. And, and the question should be, you should be asking before that hits the market is does that offer make the life easier or harder for the customer to work with us, <laughs> right? And so that chief customer officer should be 
should be dating that, right? Okay, we have a new product capability, a new service capability. Is that making the life easier for the customer to work with us? Is it creating more friction or or less friction? And if it's not creating less friction, why are we doing this? Why are we throwing it out there? I think to your point that that coordination, that rationalization across all these different pockets in the company becomes more and more you know critical. Oh, pleasure is mine. Thank you. Thank you. Always great to be back here with the family and uh, regards to JB as well. All right. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.